hey, welcome. We are so glad you decided to join us today, and I hope you're having a wonderful 4th of July weekend. Today is a special day for King's Church. As you've noticed, we've had guest speakers with us over the last few months who have brought incredible message from the, messages from the Word of God. The last two weeks, we've had conversations about things happening in our country that if, if you missed that, you've got to go back and hear those conversations. But today's special in a different regard. Today, we not only hear from someone different, we actually join another church. So Jubilee Church in St. Louis, Missouri, led by Pastor Brian Mowry, is the church that sent Rebecca and I and a few others to Kansas City to start King's Church. And, and because of this kind of digital age that we're living in and coronavirus allowing us not to gather in person, we have this special opportunity to join Jubilee for their entire service this morning. So I'm excited about that. Lead Pastor Brian Mowry, he's going to introduce today for us here in just a moment. Before he does, though, I want to let you know that the next four weeks at King's Church, the next four weeks are going to be a little bit different. I'm so excited about this series that we're getting ready to, to launch called This Is Us, about the vision and values of King's Church. What do we believe? What do we live for in this house called King's Church? This is us. And I thought over these next four weeks, instead of me and a few others contributing to the series, what if we represented all of King's Church? So the next four weeks, we're going to be doing Zoom calls, not premiering on Facebook and YouTube. So number one, if you don't have the Zoom app, make sure you download the Zoom app so you can link into that call. Number two, if you're not on our email mailing list, send us an email at office at kingschurchkc.com and we'll make sure you get all the information this week about next week's Zoom call. And if you go, Dylan, I don't know if I'm on the mailing list. Well, if you've never received an email from us, you're not on the mailing list. So make sure you drop us that email. We're so excited to kick off this series. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jubilee as they lead us in a song of worship. Would you sing with us? He is the light that makes a way. He is the one that breaks the chain. the love that never fails. He is the hope that saves the day. He took the guilt and gave us grace. Sing the name Jesus. Sing the name Jesus. In your name there is wonderful power. In your Now this heart is filled with praise and forever I will sing the name Jesus, sing the name Jesus. Your 
this heart is filled with praise and forever I will sing the name of Jesus sing the name of Jesus
stop worshiping your name, singing about today is true. Lord, that though our sins were like scarlet to you, they were like filthy rags, the scriptures say. The best that we could offer you was just like filthy rags compared to your holiness, compared to your splendor, compared to your worth. And I thank you, Lord, that we don't have to stand upon our own righteousness, but today we stand on the righteousness given to us by, as a gift by Christ Jesus through his death and resurrection. And, and Lord, that's why we sing this song. Thank you. That's why we sing these songs about how wonderful you are, how you're a wonderful Savior, how you're a wonderful friend. Lord, we want to give you all the praise and the honor and the glory today because you have turned our sin, uh, Lord, that was like scarlet and you've washed it white as snow. I pray, remind each and every one of us of that truth. Wherever my brothers and sisters are at watching this right now, pray in Jesus' name, would you reaffirm their faith in Jesus today? Would you come and remind them of these wonderful truths? Firm up our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Kings family, I am so honored that you are joining with us today in our service, Jubilee Church, and you have picked a great Sunday uh, to join us because I'm not preaching. But the Andrew Wilson uh, is preaching uh, for us in our series called Family Friends. And you guys are family, so I hope that you consider Andrew a, a friend as well. If you don't know Andrew, uh, man, he is not just a humble guy, but he is a, he is a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, he has uh, lots of degrees uh, from places like Cambridge. Uh, he's a debater. He has written for Christianity Today. He has a popular blog and Twitter following, and he is rooted in the local church as a teaching pastor for one of our um, New Frontiers Church called King's Church in the heart of London, very diverse church. Uh, he has impacted the way I think. He's impacted my theology as much as anyone that I can think of. And so I wanted him to speak to Jubilee, and I hope that you um, would really give him your attention, give him your mind, your heart. He's going to encourage you. I asked him. If he, I asked him to preach on something smart, like you know, can Jubilee Church hear somebody smart for once? And so I gave him the very difficult topic of how could a good God allow suffering in this world. So he's going to tackle that. It's going to encourage you. Uh, it's going to uh, teach you, and it's going to lead you to Jesus. Hi there. It is so good to be with you. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson and I'm from King's Church in London and it is a huge joy to be with you, at least in this form to be with you. I'm hoping to visit your city next year actually in February, um, which I'm very, very excited about because I've, I've obviously seen the big sort of arc, but other than that, I don't really know much about St. Louis, but I'm very much looking forward to coming and, and seeing you and hopefully meeting some of you. I have actually known Brian and Rachel for a few years. They to me, they just provide such a wonderful fusion of joy and wisdom uh, as a couple. Uh, Rachel is just one of the smiliest, most effervescent people I've ever met. And Brian has this wonderful wisdom to him that he says wise things about things that people don't normally say wise things about. Um, and I don't know how much of it is because he's got a very good sort of enigmatic, strokey beard face. I don't know whether it's because he's got this sort of gravitas in his voice and his manner and his hair that even though he's only a little bit older than me, he feels like he's got a lot more years and sort of sense behind him. I, I don't know what it is. Um, but I find them just a wonderful couple. And I'm now, by the way, I assume everyone in St. Louis is like that. 
I assume I could just walk around and I could meet a million people and they'd all be filled with joy and wisdom and so would all of you. So I'm very much looking forward to coming and seeing you and being part of your city. I'm never, as I say, never visited, but we are part of the same family of churches. And so I just wanted to bring you greetings from my church in London. This is, a, this is not our church. This is our staff team, picture of our staff team. Uh, but I hope, you know, you can see them just sort of smiling and looking enthusiastic. Obviously, this is before uh, lockdown and social distancing all kicked in. But uh, it's just, it, as, a, as a church, we feel connected to you and to, to Brian and to the whole U.S. network of churches and confluence and so on. I've spoken at a number of conferences for a bunch of pastors in your network as well. And I, I just love being with you. And as I say, very much looking forward to seeing you, hopefully, in February, uh, corona permitting, I don't know. But I wanted to speak today about something which I guess is a perennial question that Christians face, but it's a particularly pressing one in the strange days we're living through at the moment. I want to speak on the subject of evil. I want to speak on the subject of evil. And if you have a Bible, do you want to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4? Just going to read a few verses from there, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. But I want us to think about the problem of evil from a Christian point of view. I want to engage with the question, actually, that is often asked by unbelievers and by Christians alike. It's always asked. In fact, this is a massive question all the time, but it's a particularly massive question in these days we're living through. How could a loving God possibly allow suffering? Like how, how do you believe in a God who could stop suffering like this from happening and he isn't? Now, that is something that we are always facing. We in the church I used to be in in Eastbourne where we, we ran a survey about six years ago uh, called The Big Objections where we kind of did a poll in our town and said, what do you think the biggest objection, what's the reason you're not a Christian? What's the biggest problem you have with Christian belief? And we got hundreds and hundreds of answers. But by far, the most widely voted for answer was the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. We had dozens of people giving all of the, basically expressing that problem in different ways. The one that I, I remember, I think, struck, struck me, I just thought, yes, what a good formulation of a question. One person wrote, does God love us all? The Bible says God's a God of love and loves us all. So why does he let us suffer with illness, starvation, abuse, suffering, and many more dreadful things in the world time and time again? Sometimes enough is enough. When's it going to end? They wrote and then hit send. And loads of people said things very similar to that. And I said, that's always, and that wasn't in a particularly bad year. That wasn't in a year like 2020, where we, I think we probably all agree, are going through times of extremely demanding uh, challenge, opposition, suffering, evil, very, very visible among us. The events of the last few weeks and months have made it even more pressing, I think, with natural evil in the form of an invisibly small virus and human evil in the form of racist violence and murder and all the rest, that's hitting our cities and hitting our world. We are very aware of the extent of evil in the world. And so the last few weeks and months have only made that question worse. I suspect if that person was to write that question now, it would be even more emphatically stated than it was then. And so as a Christian, I've got to ask that question. And you may be asking that question yourself today. You probably are in some measure. And as a Christian, I've got to answer the question, how on earth can you believe in and worship a God who allows suffering like this? Let me read to you just a few verses from Ecclesiastes 4, which, by the way, are not going to solve the problem. They're actually going to make it worse. Right? Just, just so you're really glad you came. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold... The tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who hasn't yet been and hasn't seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. This is the word of God. That's a bleak text, right? I mean, that is just about the darkest thing the Bible ever says. It's not the whole sum total of what the Bible says about this subject. In many ways, the whole Christian story is an answer and a way of addressing the problem of evil in the world. But we've got to face it, stare it straight in the face, haven't we? This world is racked with 
awful things that shouldn't be there. And I think the problem of evil is by far the most powerful objection to Christian belief. And there's, there's always different ones. And I'm only in my early 40s, but I've still already in my lifetime seen a whole variety of different questions become the main question people ask. It might, you know, now sexuality happens a lot. 20 years ago, people weren't asking that. But a lot of people are asking about science and new atheism, and now they aren't really. But whichever other ones go up and down, the problem of suffering is always there. It's always a huge issue. And the reason is that it combines an apparently logical argument with a very powerful emotional appeal, which we heard in the question I just read to you. So in the next few minutes, what I want to do by way of addressing this question, how does a loving God allow evil, suffering, whatever you call it, I want to address some of those objections in three ways. What I want to do first, I want to give you the short answer to the question, why does God allow suffering? Right? Second, I want to look at the logical problem of evil. Right? Why, why people might give a logical or philosophical argument that evil means God doesn't exist. And thirdly, I want to look at the emotional problem of evil, which in many ways in our day is a stronger one. Right? So the short answer, then looking at the logical argument against God from evil, and then the emotional argument as well. So first, the short answer to the question, why does God allow suffering? You ready? Hands out. The short answer is, we don't know. We, we don't know. And that's incredibly important that we have the humility as Christians to concede that. Because a lot of approaches to this question assume that the answer is there for us to, be, to find. And that in each individual situation, some configuration of this mixed with that mixed with that will give you an answer. So there, and then we can figure out what the answer is and then we can explain it. And we can say, here's why, the, here's why suffering's happening. Here's why evil's happening. You want to know why that's in that person's heart? You want to know why this terrible thing happened? It's because of this. That's what we want. We want an explanation. And the Bible doesn't give us one. But oftentimes what we do is we start trying to answer that question. And then in doing it, we've provided an explanation that means that we're, so far as we're concerned, suffering's not an issue. It's not a problem. So we might say, ah, oh, suffering happens because of free choices. It's because of free will. To which the, answer, the response is, well, sometimes it is. I'm sure if I jump, make a free choice to jump off the top of a building, I'm going to break my leg or die. Yeah, that suffering is caused by free will, but a lot of it isn't. The vast majority of people who've got sick and died of this virus, in the life, they were not making unwise choices particularly. They just got the virus anyway. That's not, that's not the reason. Or sometimes people will say, well, suffering happens because physical laws exist and physical laws are necessary for life. And you say, yeah, but all of us live under the same physical laws, but some of us suffer a great deal more than others. And of course, many of the people in history who've suffered the most are dead now. And they've seen far more than we have mostly. Or people will say, I ah, know it's not that. It's that suffering happens to enhance and prepare our souls for eternity. It's to purify us of sin and I might say, yeah, I expect sometimes that is what happens. I think probably there are occasions where suffering happens in a guided way to try and teach us something. But my goodness, there are some people who suffer an enormous amount and seem actually to have great levels of maturity and other people who are incredibly infantile and foolish who don't seem to suffer anything like as much. And the Bible often raises that exact point, not least in books like Ecclesiastes. It doesn't mean anything. You get some people who are very, very wealthy and some people are very, very poor and there's no rhyme or reason. And the Psalms do it as well. And some people will even say, our sufferings here is a consequence of sin. But again, the number of good people who suffer, and actually the number of bad people who don't seem to do that much, is far longer than you or I might like it to be. And that means that the answers that you and I might want to give to suffering happens because of this, just don't work in real life. And the scriptures provide us with some incredibly rich perspectives on suffering and death and evil, but they never say all suffering is because of this. In fact, the longest book in the Bible to approach the question of suffering, the book of Job, is basically a debunking of that exact way of thinking. It's basically a long argument, lots of different people saying, well, here's why I think it happens. And then at the end of the book, it goes, no, it's not that. It's a mystery here, friends. There's something we have to acknowledge in humility. We don't know. Maybe some suffering is because of a choice or physical laws or to enhance our soul or a consequence of sin. But if somebody asks me, why does God allow suffering? I think the best short Christian answer I can give them is we don't know. We don't know. 
And for many people, saying that you don't know why God allows suffering sounds like an admission of defeat. It sounds like I'm admitting that the problem of evil cannot be answered and therefore that it disproves God. Which then takes us on to the second topic, which is the logical problem of evil, right? So what some people will think, hearing what I've just said is, why does God allow evil if he's all loving and all powerful? And I say, don't know. They think you say, aha, we've caught you out. That proves that there is no God. That's the logical argument from evil. And the logical argument goes roughly like this. Number one, an all-powerful, all-loving God would not allow suffering. Number two, but suffering exists. Number three, therefore, God doesn't, right? If God was all-loving and all-powerful, there wouldn't be any evil, but there is, so he doesn't. It looks pretty compelling, right? It looks pretty watertight. But there's a huge problem with it, and that problem is one of the reasons why philosophers very rarely use this argument as, a, as an argument against the existence of God, because what the argument assumes is that because I cannot think of a good reason why God might allow suffering, there isn't one. That's the, that's the assumption of the argument, right? We could reframe the argument like this. An all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God would not allow any suffering or evil without a good reason. Number two, I can't think of such a good reason. Right? Those two are both true. Number three is the problem. Number three, therefore, there isn't one. I can't think of one, so there isn't one. Number four, suffering exists. Number five, therefore, an all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing God does not exist. That's actually a slightly better way of formulating the argument. But what it does is to show us that the challenge here is with number three. The fact that because I can't think of a reason why God might allow suffering, I know for certain that there isn't one to the extent that I can logically disprove God by doing it. Now, most societies in history, as I've already alluded to, have witnessed far more suffering than almost anybody who lives in the United States or in Britain today. Most people in history have. And most of them have not handled the problem of evil in quite the way that we do. Many of them, whether Eastern or Western, whether religious in the way we understand it or in quite a different religious tradition, many of them have, have gone for something a bit more like this. The gods or, the, or God or might be loving and powerful, but they would not um, permit suffering without a good reason. I can't think of such a good reason, but then I'm a person. And he, they, she, I don't know, are God. And therefore, it doesn't particularly bother me that I can't think of one, because if they're all knowing and I'm not, then I wouldn't know, would I? Four, suffering exists. Five, well, that's a mystery then, isn't it? Now, you will find arguments like that or thinking or a, even a spirit like that in many writings from many different religious traditions, including a great many Christian ones. And there's something actually much more biblical about that outlook on the world. And intellectual historians sometimes point out that the, the challenge of the problem of evil to Western people, as we would now call, I guess people like me, Western people, began to emerge at exactly the same time that Europeans were beginning to think we understood everything about the world. In the middle of the 18th century, the problem of evil becomes a huge problem. Until that point, it's always been an issue for people, but it wasn't a reason to disbelieve in God. It was a reason to call out to God and ask him for help. Whereas now, more and more, as we've begun to think we understand everything about the world, the problem of evil has become the main reason why people don't believe in God. But let me illustrate this. Like, let's say I go into my conservatory, the back of my house, and I can't see my dog in there. Now, my dog, Zindel, is an enormous, he's like the shape of a lion, he's a massive golden retriever, big, hairy beast of a dog, great fun, but, you know, huge dog. And if I go into the conservatory and Rachel, my wife, shouts and says, Andrew, is Zindel in the conservatory? I can't see him. And if I look around and I say, and I can't see the dog, then I'll show back, no, he's not in here. Because I know that if he was there, I would be able to see him. But now let's say that instead of saying, is Zindel in the conservatory? She says, is a coronavirus in the conservatory? What do I say then? I don't know. I mean, I can't see one, but I wouldn't be able to see one even if there was. So maybe there is, maybe there isn't. The fact that I can't see one doesn't prove it's not there. It simply proves that I'm not a capable of seeing that kind of thing. And the comedian Bill Murray, I like, he says it in a more mischievous way. He says, there is literally no way of knowing how many chameleons are in your house. I love that comment. 
No, there's no way of knowing because they're all in disguise. I think, okay, so when we're dealing with the, the problem of evil and an all-knowing, all-powerful God, are we dealing with something that is staringly obvious or with something that might well be mysterious to the point of being invisible to many of us or all of us? And I think if God is infinite and all-knowing, we have to at least allow for the possibility that he has reasons for things that happen in the earth that I can't see or fathom and that I could live with that mystery or at least I could not use that mystery as a reason to argue that he mustn't exist. I might expect that the reasons for suffering might be like an invisible virus rather than like a massive golden retriever. And as a result of that, most philosophers don't really go with the logical argument from evil, saying you can prove there's no God because of evil. They say that's not actually true. That's only true if you can be certain that any reason for evil would be known by a finite human mind and there seem reasons to doubt that. So that's why the logical argument from evil wouldn't work. Right? So I said, we're going to do a short answer first and then the logical answer, uh, the logical argument. But well, then thirdly and finally, we need to look at, I guess, the really pressing difficult bit of this, which comes, comes on us a lot right now as I'm speaking, is that there is a very strong emotional argument against the existence of a loving God, even if the logical argument doesn't hold up. And it goes basically, you can say what you like, Andrew. You can say what you like about God and mystery and hope, but dying children cannot be reconciled. Racist abuse like that cannot be, viruses like this cannot be reconciled with the existence of a loving God. Come what may. I don't care if you give me a logical spiel. I'm just saying at an emotional level, this cannot be right. And I feel that too, right? I do. I'm not just saying that to try and get alongside you. I, my family is probably relatively typical here. I would expect in this regard, right? And my grandfather was captured in a POW camp for three and a half years and experienced some of the worst things that ever happened to people, I suppose, while he was there. I knew him pretty well. He never really talked about it. So I kind of had some of that. I've seen some of that, I suppose, and its impact on a person. I've had three suicides in my extended family among my cousins. Um, and one of them killed not only himself, but his daughter as well. It's just in my family. Um, but two of my children have got regressive autism and my daughter's got epilepsy and we've had all the thing where the hospital come around she's turning blue and have to be rushed in we've, we've had that in our own home my godmother was a missionary out in Africa and she was raped her husband was shot in the head blew half his head off he's survived miraculously but it's obviously half his face is missing and we're not unusual in that like this is just this is just people I know that are close to me and you've got many people like this in your life too and all of us as human beings simply look around at one another and say this is everywhere I feel the same emotional visceral hatred of evil that you do and I can honestly say that I do not know how people can cope with that emotional hatred of evil without something like the Christian gospel I don't know where people take it if they don't take it to Jesus without knowing that there is a God who has not only made the world, but has said a decisive no to evil at the cross of Jesus Christ and then begun a new creation without it. I don't know where else people go with it. You see, if I take my visceral objection to evil in the world and I take it to there being no God, I've got nothing to do with it. I've got no hope at all. All I can say is this is awful. And I'm saying that to nobody in particular, with no hope whatsoever that it's got any explanation or purpose or meaning or that anything can or will be done about it. Within the Christian understanding, I have at the very least, at an emotional level, I've got somewhere to go with my pain. That's why the biggest book right at the heart of the Bible, this massive book of songs in the middle of the Bible we call the Psalms, is filled with lament. That's why the book of Job goes on for over 40 chapters saying, this is some of the ways that people have tried to think about suffering, but none of it makes any sense of it. This is why the cross of Christ is such a dark moment. No matter how many times we put it on a chain around our necks, it is the darkest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. And it is God's decisive no to the power of evil. Say, evil is not, I'm not going to make light of it. I'm going to say evil's no problem. I'm going to say evil is such a big problem that I have to come and die for it. And without that, I don't really know what you and I could do with the emotional anguish we feel about it. In the secular materialist story that we are born into, in your country and mine, there is no basis for declaring anything to be evil, objectively speaking. Creatures are born, 
creatures die, the weak eat the strong, and there's no reason to say that any of that is wrong, there's no shoulder to cry on, there's no hope that it will ever be made right, and evil wins. In the Christian story, there's a very clear basis for saying that things are good and evil. Creation is good, suffering is awful, God enters into our pain in the person of Jesus, human evil is first renounced and then forgiven, Death is defeated on Easter Sunday. The world is ultimately made new and love wins. And in that sense, I think the Christian gospel provides us far more power to cope with the emotional problem of suffering than the secular one does or than any other religious one does because it pivots on a God who lives and dies as one of us to rescue us from the very sufferings and evils that we're talking about having experienced their full force in his own 33 years, and especially at the end, he then takes them on himself, breaks their power, dies, is buried, and then rises again, as if to say to the world, don't fear, far more can be mended than you know. And my story witnesses to the power of the Christian gospel to make sense of and hold up under tragedy. That's true of my life. It's true of the lives of many of the people watching this right now. So I began today by asking the question, why was God allow, would God allow suffering and saying to it that I think the short answer is, I don't know. We don't know. So I don't know what the answer is. But when I look at Jesus on the cross, risen from the dead, ascended in glory, I may not know what the answer is, but I know what the answer isn't. I know that the reason why God has allowed suffering is not because he doesn't love us. It's not because he doesn't care. When I look at God revealed in Jesus, dying for us, becoming like us, suffering with us, and rising again to free us, I know that the answer is not, oh, God has allowed suffering because he doesn't really love us very much, or he doesn't really care very much, or he doesn't really like us or want to do anything about it. Jesus enables me and you to say, I don't know why this is happening, but I know that God loves me and that he loves everyone who has ever suffered and that he will ultimately not only fix evil, but somehow turn all of it into good. And I don't know how that's going to happen, but I'm sure looking forward to finding out. And that answer may or may not resolve all the logical questions you have, but I think it's emotionally satisfying in a way that no other answer ever could be. A philosopher, Blaise Pascal, of Pascal's Triangle fame, said, actually, what you've got to do before you start trying to persuade something, someone that something's true, you've got to, first of all, make them want it to be true. I, I put it to you that you may or may not yet be persuaded that the Christian story is true, but if anything like what I've just said is true, you should really want it to be. If that's the Christian narrative, if that's what will one day happen to evil in the Christian narrative, you and I should want that to be true. We should desire to find out if it is. And for those of us who are already believers in Jesus, we should be to a point able to suspend judgment on the whys and the wherefores and acknowledge that we do have to live with mystery. But ultimately knowing that God will provide not only an answer, but a great turnaround that will turn all of our sadness into a glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the person of Jesus without whom I don't know that I'd have any hope of making sense of any of this. I still have so many questions myself about the events of the last few weeks and months, but I, we, come to you in thankfulness and love, saying we are grateful for your sacrifice for us, and we pray that you would help those of us, all of us to some degree, who are suffering with the trials and troubles of this life, to cling in faith to the God who promises that he is making all things new. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.